It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Yesterday, Ontario's lowest paid education workers, educational assistants, custodians, early childhood educators, told the government to get serious about negotiating a fair deal. But instead of respecting the process, today the education minister will move to impose a contract on these workers and ban their right to strike. His actions have brought us to the brink of disruption in our schools. He's creating an unnecessary crisis for families and for education workers. Will the Premier stop these reckless actions and get back to the bargaining table today? To reply, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, our government is unyielding in our commitment to keep kids in the classroom. That is the most important thing we can do. Children have faced perhaps some of the most difficulty in modern history, their mental and physical health, their social and emotional development, and their academic success is at risk. The union has confirmed yesterday they're on a path to a strike effective this Friday. And so yesterday, the government reached out to this specific union with the intent of offering a better deal, 10% over four years, maintaining the best pensions and benefits and 131 days of sick leave in this country. That is a reasonable offer because nothing should come in the way of a child's right to learn. It has been so difficult on children, and that's why, Speaker, we're standing up. We're making clear we will do everything possible to keep kids in the classroom. Questions. Speaker, again to the Premier, it's this government that's getting in the way of making sure our schools are open and in good shape. <laughs> Students deserve a government that invests in ensuring there are enough caring adults in schools and our education workers deserve a decent wage. Education workers are integral to our schools, but because of chronically low wages, half Half have been forced to take a second job just to make ends meet, and a quarter have either cut back on purchasing food or have had to use a food bank. Does the Premier think it's acceptable to pay education workers so little that they have to rely on food banks? Mr. Education. Speaker, what is unacceptable is New Democrats and Liberals' support of a strike this Friday. Mr. Speaker, we believe children deserve to be in class. That's why, Speaker, we gave QP an opportunity yesterday where we presented a better deal, 10 per cent over four years, the maintenance of the best benefits and pension and sick leave programs in the nation. Our workers do important work in our school. We value what they do. It's why, Speaker, we're offering them an increase every single year over the course of their program. We said to them yesterday, work with us, rescind your commitment to strike on Friday and bargain to get a deal. They decided, Mr. Speaker, they decided that they're going to proceed Order. with a strike on Friday, imposing further hardship on children who have faced unprecedented difficulty in this province. Order. This government believes children should be in school, and we will stand up to ensure they remain there without disruption. Right to Order. Order. The final supplementary. So again to the Premier, I gather that hunger is acceptable. I, I, that's the, the one thing that we're going to let pass. Last year, the government posted a $2.1 billion surplus, and the Financial Accountability Office has projected that this government will run surpluses for the next six years, totaling about $25 billion. But at the bargaining table, at the bargaining table, the minister says the cupboard is bare for Ontario's lowest-paid education workers. Education workers support students and schools every day, but this government would rather cry poor than pay them a fair wage and protect education. Why is this government so intent on shortchanging our schools and our education workers? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to keeping children in class. We made a clear commitment to the people of this province that we will stand up and ensure kids are in school without disruption right to June, and nothing should get in the way of that commitment. Mr. Speaker, we gave the union an opportunity, and with great regret, they said no. They're going to proceed with the strike on Friday, impose further hardship on the children we all represent. 
We have to speak for kids in this debate. We have to give them a voice in this discussion. We have to ensure they are able to be in the classroom learning the fundamentals they have missed over the past two to three years. Order. Keeping in mind, Speaker, just three years ago, they faced union-driven strikes and then a global pandemic. Official we opposition to come to order. everything possible as we have to date to ensure children remain in class. Member for right Davenport, come to order. Friends getting back on track. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Speaker, Speaker, education support workers are the backbone of our schools, but most can't make ends meet. In August, I told the Premier about Charity. She was the full-time education support worker who relied on food banks to help feed her children. Food banks, Speaker. I asked the Premier then if you'd commit to a pay increase so that education support workers like Charity wouldn't have to rely on food banks. And today, that answer is a resounding no. The Conservative government is set to impose co a contract on education support workers denying the right to bargain a fair wage. Speaker, why does the Conservative government think it's acceptable to force workers to work for so little? Minister of Education. Speaker, we are firmly committed to keeping kids in the classroom where they belong. We believe that that is so important to helping these kids catch up. You know, Mr. Speaker, we have heard from leaders, pediatric experts, about the challenges of mental health on children, their physical health, their social and emotional regression, and their academic regression taking place as a result of The member of for Davenport needs. will come to order. And Mr. Speaker, when you hear these stories of individual children and the plight they have faced over the past years, it is incumbent on everyone in this legislature to ensure that they are in a classroom supported loved and cared for by their educators and with their friends. Our plan to catch up is premised on keeping them in the classroom. And Order. so, yes, Speaker, we are going to stand up and ensure children remain in school without disruption right to June. The member for Sudbury, supplementary question. Speaker, the minister wants to talk about children. These are children whose parents have to go to food banks in order to feed them, and he ignores it and looks the other way. Last week, I met with a room full of education support workers, and Corey was one of them. She is a single mom of two. She loves her job as a cleaner and works hard to ensure students are safe and that they have a healthy school environment, Speaker. Corey told me she recently had to move in with her parents just to make ends meet. Corey is underpaid and she's overworked, Speaker. She wants a fair wage so she can support her children while doing a job she loves, a job that is important. Will the Conservative government and the minister finally recognize that education support workers like Corey deserve more than a nickel so they can support student success. Mr. Education. Mr. Speaker, we are absolutely committed and will take action to ensure children remain in the classroom where they belong. Mr. Speaker, yesterday we went to the union and we offered them an increased offer from the last that we have tabled. 10 percent over four years, maintaining the Member best pension, Ottawa Center come to order. the best sick leave program of 131 pay days in addition to the best pension. And Mr. Speaker, when we gave the union an off-ramp to avert a strike, to withdraw their, their commitment to strike on Friday, they regrettably doubled down on their demand for a nearly 50 per cent increase in pay. Opposition, a come to order. A billion dollar increase to the taxpayer when applied sector-wide, because we know, Speaker, whatever we do with education workers becomes the minimum standard with our educators and those unions. So, Speaker, we brought forth a reasonable offer that preserves Response. the in-class learning and protects the rights of children to learn. We're going to continue to do everything possible to keep kids in the classroom. Again, to the Premier, it would be lovely if you could answer. Good morning, Premier. It's good to see you. Yes, Speaker, this is not how you build a quality education system. Our Order. kids will have less support in schools if the Premier keeps chasing away education workers with these poverty wages. QP will be at the table all week, ready to negotiate with the Conservative government, Speaker. Will this government commit to not tabling preemptive legislation and instead return to the table and bargain a fair deal that will invest in our schools and education support workers? Of education. Mr. Speaker, we are firmly committed to doing everything humanly possible to keep kids in the classroom, and that's why we have been clear on that commitment Order. from day one with all education unions, which we've been bargaining in good faith, with the intent of landing a voluntary deal. But what we will not accept is a strike on children after this global pandemic and recent uh, strikes by the unions just two to three years ago. Children should be in the classroom, and our government will do everything possible and take the action that families want to keep their kids in front of their teachers in the classroom in every region of this province, Speaker. Back to clock. Okay. I'm going to ask the House to come to order, and I have to say this, if members continue to ignore my requests 
to come to order. I will move to uh, warnings. No choice. And then we know what happens after that if I'm ignored. All right. Start the clock. The member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ambulance shortages have recently become a recurring problem in Waterloo Region and across Ontario. Two weeks ago, during a code red, ambulances were coming into Waterloo Region from Guelph-Wellington for backup, only for Guelph-Wellington to end up in a code red the following day. At one point, 600,000 people did not have access to an ambul ambulance or a paramedic. In Waterloo Region, we've lost 17 paramedics since January, largely due to burnout and lack of time off. It's literally a matter of life and death that Ontario is this ill-equipped to care for its growing and aging population. So I ask the Premier, I ask the Minister, I ask anyone on that side of the House, how would you feel if you and your loved one experienced a medical emergency and no one was there to answer the call? What would you do? Because that's where the province of Ontario is at right now. Member for Eglinton Lawrence, and Parliament. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Obviously, we're doing everything we can to make sure the ambulances are there when they're needed, and we have a four-point strategy in place to decrease ambulance offload times, which is holding up some of the ambulances, including returning ambulances to the communities faster, providing timely and appropriate care in the community, increasing non-ambulance transport services for medically stable patients, and we're maximizing health human resource uh, capacity. And we're doing all of those things as well as updating Ontario Regulation 25700 under the Ambulance Act, which allows other uh, health care professionals, including physicians, nurses, uh, respiratory therapists, uh, to provide patient care in addition to paramedics in air ambulance or other configurations where that is necessary. And we're going to make sure that we build a better health care system here in Ontario. Supplementary question. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, code red, code black, code zero, it all means the same frightening thing, uh, that not a single ambulance is available for the entire region. According to Dave Bryant, who's the co-VP of QP 5191, the Region of Waterloo Paramedic Service, uh, they had the highest number of code reds the region has ever had within a 24-hour period on September 26. A local paramedic told me that at one point there were five full hours where no ambulance were available, uh, and offload times ranged from seven hours to 22 hours. Uh, when the minister and the, or the parliamentary assistant says that they're doing everything that they can, clearly that is not correct because you have Bill 124 on the books. This is wage suppression legislation. It is pushing health care workers and nurses out of the province Order. of Ontario. And with all due respect, you actually have the money to recognize Question. and respect health care workers in Ontario. So how can this government continue to sit by idly when another crucial part of our health care system is collapsing and you are sticking to your speaking points? I remind the members to make their comments to the chair. Member for Eglinton Lawrence to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite. After decades of underfunding, it is this government that has made unprecedented investments in our health care system. We're investing. $77.5 billion into our health care system this year. Health care funding has increased at 6.2 per cent year over year, the largest increase in, on record, including an over $5 billion increase in base funding and 8.9 per cent increase in base funding, which is unprecedented. No previous base funding increase has been that increase year over year. We've added 3,500 new hospital beds. We're in the process of adding another 3,000. We've added 11,700 health care workers. The College of Nurses of Ontario recently said that they've added 12,800, over 12,800 new nurses before the year ends, the most ever recorded. This government will get it done. Order. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Last week, the minister and I were in Burlington at the Cultivated Bee to announce the opening of a new 130,000-square-foot manufacturing and innovation hub. This company is performing groundbreaking work in the field of biotechnology and cellular agriculture. 
Not only are they true leaders in innovation, but with their over $50 million investment, will bring 200 jobs to my community. Speaker, will the minister tell us why the Cultivated Bee, a German company, chose to invest here in Ontario? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Cultivated Bee's expansion into Ontario is game-changing for the people of Burlington and their entire region. Their $50 million investment will create 200 well-paying jobs and boost the local economy, and it will secure Ontario's position as a global leader in biotechnology. You know, when companies look for investment opportunities, they look for a place that has a skilled workforce, supports growth and investment, and is open for business. That's the message we heard from Cultivated Bee and other German companies when, our, when we were on our recent mission to Germany and Austria. They want certainty. They want a reliable, stable business environment, and they want safe communities for their employees. This exciting investment by the Cultivated Bee sends a really strong message that Ontario Response. is the perfect place to invest and grow. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. It's great to hear that Ontario is seen as a competitive and supportive place for businesses to invest and create jobs. I'm proud to represent the great people of Burlington, a city that is home to a thriving and innovative economy of entrepreneurs. Unfortunately, under the previous Liberal government, the goal of entrepreneurship was not supported. Many hardworking individuals faced excessive red tape, barriers and obstacles. Speaker, will the minister please explain what our government is doing to help entrepreneurs in my riding start and grow businesses? Mr. Economic Development. Our entrepreneurs are critical to the prosperity of Ontario families. Now, we all know that the Liberals and the NDP made entrepreneurship too difficult and too costly. Under the previous government, hydro, red tape and taxes quickly spiraled out of control. By lowering the cost of doing business in Ontario by $7 billion every single year and every single year coming, we've seen businesses coming back to Ontario in record numbers. Another company, Ace Age, announced a $1.5 million healthcare technology project bringing 25 good-paying jobs to Burlington with the help of a $600,000 in provincial funding. We also invested $415,000 in Burlington's Small Business Enterprise Centre to offer entrepreneurs everything they need to turn their ideas into a business, and, and another $106,000 for their summer company to help students and young entrepreneurs start their business. Speaker, this is how our government is helping entrepreneurs. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, last week, the Toronto Star revealed that workers who were forced to work in deemed essential manufacturing jobs died in larger numbers from COVID than any other sector, more than even our embattled healthcare workers, Speaker. Under this government's watch, hundreds of workers, vulnerable workers in Ontario, were, they were dying while making things like floor tiles, things like bubble gum, jerry cans. And throughout the pandemic, Speaker, I have asked member opposite to provide clarity on what criteria defines essential, and they failed to answer. But surely the Premier of this province would know something as critical as the meaning of essential work, based upon which a policy, a major policy of life and death was determined, Speaker. So my question, question is simple. Premier, please define what is essential work? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the priority of this government is to ensure that when workers uh, go to work, they come home safe after the end of a hard day's work. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the pandemic was uh, certainly a challenging for the entire world, but Mr. Speaker, uh, we were the first in Canada to bring in job protected leave. If anyone uh, needed to stay home because of the pandemic, their job would Order. be 
uh, protected. But furthermore, Mr. Speaker, uh, we hired more than 100 new health and safety inspectors to ensure that workplaces uh, are safe uh, in this province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Order. we've done more than 100,000 health Order. and safety inspections to ensure that uh, employers and workers are uh, working in a safe manner. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue uh, every single day ensuring that uh, workers in this province have the safest workplaces Response. in the country. The supplementary question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. Again to the Premier. Speaker, at least 108 Ontario workers died from work-related COVID infections under a government that for more than a year denied workers paid sick days so they could recover and keep their co-workers safe. The evidence is clearer than ever that paid sick days saved lives. This government waited far too long to introduce temporary paid sick days and then didn't provide enough days for sick workers to get well. Forced them to go back to work sick and putting their co-workers at risk. Speaker, will this government pass my bill, the Stay Home If You Are Sick Act, this month so that every Ontario worker can access the 10 permanent paid sick days they deserve? For labor, immigration, training, and skills development. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue ensuring that uh, workers in Ontario have the safest workplaces uh, in the country. That's why, Mr. Speaker, at the beginning of this pandemic, we were the first uh, in Canada to bring in job-protected leave. We were the first province in the country to bring in uh, paid sick days. And Mr. Speaker, uh, in July, I extended Order. those three paid sick days uh, for workers uh, in this province to the end of March uh, next year. And Mr. Speaker, uh, we're going to continue every single day having the backs of workers in this province to ensure that when they go to work uh, in the morning, they come home safe to their family at the end of a hard day's work. Next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario is seeing strong economic growth and great new manufacturing investments. We only have to look at the $5 billion investment made by Stellantis in building a new EV battery plant as a positive example. This trend towards a greener electrical transportation sector and the return of the manufacturing jobs to Ontario is positive news, Speaker. As the economy grows and greater electrification of industries continues, my constituents in Whitby are wondering about the strength of our energy grid for the future. Speaker, can the Minister of Energy assure my constituents and all Ontarians that we will have the power we need for the future? Good question. To reply, the Minister of Energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to assure the member from Whitby that yes, the power is going to be there and the lights will go on when they flick the switches in Canada's clean energy capital in Durham region. We're taking action to ensure that our electricity grid can support the incredible growth and the electrification that we're seeing in Ontario. Our work includes announcing Canada's first grid-scale small modular reactor on the site not too far from his riding in Darlington, Mr. Speaker. And just last week, I was pleased to join my federal counterpart, Minister Wilkinson. $970 million is on its way to that project from the Canada Infrastructure Bank, Speaker. We're supporting the continued operation of Pickering, Pickering Nuclear Generating Station. We've increased um, efficiency programs, $342 million to expand those efficiency programs, Response. recontracting biomass and hydroelectric, and our ongoing competitive procurement that's in place is going to ensure we're getting the reliable and affordable electricity that we need to power this province, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. So speaker, back to the Minister of Energy. Minister, you mentioned Ontario's competitive procurement processes, and I'd like to ask you further about it. I'm glad to see that we have a plan to secure the electricity this province needs to keep powering our growth and prosperity for the future. My constituents are pleased that Ontario's increasing electrification of our energy grid, from transportation and increased EV uptake to green steelmaking. However, my constituents want to know why the province will procure some natural gas generation as a component of the overall procurement strategy. Minister, is procuring natural gas generation a step in the opposite direction? Minister of Energy. 
Thanks for the thoughtful question, Mr. Speaker. The experts at Ontario's independent electricity system operator have been clear. Generation from natural gas plays a key role as a flexible, adaptable source of electricity that can respond quickly to periods of heightened demand. The member is correct that we can't move backwards, and we're, we're, we're moving forward on the days that we're bringing manufacturing jobs that were once fleeing our province back to our jurisdiction and sent electricity prices skyrocketing, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're looking at every option to ensure that Ontario doesn't experience blackouts and brownouts. By maintaining our reliable and affordable grid, we're also enabling electrification in other sectors like transportation, resulting in a net reduction in emissions in Ontario. Just one example is green steelmaking. As he mentioned in his previous question, Algoma and DeFasco were switching Response. to electric car furnaces is going to mean emission reductions equivalent to taking two million cars off the road, Mr. Speaker. We're going to ensure that we have the reliable, affordable, clean and safe power that Ontario needs to keep our economy moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. It's Halloween, Speaker, and Ontarians are accustomed to seeing and hearing about spooky things today, but nothing prepared me for a video I saw this weekend. I saw a video of Tyler Russell, an organizer with the hate group Canada First, receiving a call from what sounds like this Premier on February 11, 2022. After our exchange, Speaker, I'll be posting this video to my Twitter account. This happened on February 11th in the middle of the convoy. If it is in fact the Premier taking this call from Mr. Russell, promising Mr. Russell, as you will see, that it was about ending vaccine mandates and COVID restrictions, that was his priority, can the Premier confirm if this in fact was him and why this conversation was even happening when my city was under siege? The government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, look, as you know, uh, last week uh, uh, Commissioner Karik was uh, uh, was before the uh, the federal inquiry uh, into the uh, federal government's uh, uh, really uh, uh, historic first time use of the uh, Federal Emergencies Act, Mr. Speaker. Uh, testimony will continue, and uh, I'm sure the Commission will uh, will uh, report uh, uh, back to the Parliament of Canada on the federal government's use of the uh, Federal Emergencies Act. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, I have one more reason now to want the Premier to take me up on my offer to give him a ride to Ottawa. We can work on the playlist together. We can figure out a way to do it together. But the people of Ottawa need you, Premier, Speaker, through you. We need him to come clean on whether this, in fact, was a conversation he had in one of our worst moments Order. of the convoy occupation crisis. I want to know if there were other members. Did the Premier talk to Pat King? Did the Premier talk to Tamara Leek? Did the Premier talk to some of the people who are organized at a high level, infiltrating our city, blocking our city, harassing residents? Speaker, it is a matter of public interest. The Premier has been silent Order. beyond talking about policing and jurisdiction. Other members of Parliament, other office holders who are not members of federal jurisdiction have had the courage to come testify in Ottawa. Again. Is this the Premier Speaker in this video? Will he come to Ottawa to testify? The government has to. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As, uh, as I said on a, a number of occasions, it, of course, it is a federal inquiry. Uh, uh, we, as you know, Mr. Speaker, when a state of emergency was uh, uh, on in uh, the province of Ontario, we, of course, uh, had a select committee that would review the state of emergency in the province of Ontario. That select committee met on a uh, monthly basis. It had uh, I appeared in front of that select committee during uh, that time uh, when the protests were happening in Ottawa. The Solicitor General at the time appeared in front of it. Prior to that, the Ministry of Health and Deputy Premier uh, uh, appeared in front of that. Uh, other officials from the Government of Ontario were in front of that. As you know, when the state of emergency provincially ended, Speaker, there were two reports issued and debate in this House. On both occasions, debate collapsed in this House when the NDP agreed that it was the right course of action. Now, having said that, Mr. Speaker, we still uh, sure are ensuring that we are working with and assisting the Commission by providing cabinet-level documents to the federal inquiry, as well as ensuring that the uh, Deputy uh, Solicitor General and the Commissioner of the OPP, who recently testified, are made available. The next question, the member for Beaches, East York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the House Leader. 
Across the world and in Ontario, we are seeing effects of climate change with extreme heat, floods and forest fires. These events rip through communities, causing, costing people their well-being, money and, in severe cases, their lives. Experts like the Insurance Bureau of Canada are sounding the alarm. The Intact Centre at the University of Waterloo tells us for every dollar invested in climate adaptation, the return is three to eight dollars worth of avoid cost avoidance. Recently, I announced the creation of an all-party climate change committee. Emergency preparedness is a non-partisan issue and we need to work together to ensure our residents are aware and ready and protected for the future. My proposal reflects the House with four Conservative members and one member from each of the other parties, outreaching to stakeholders and reporting back within six months. Will the government put forward my all-party climate change committee motion to show the people of Ontario that they are serious Question. about climate adaptation and emergency preparedness? Thank you, reply, the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and I appreciate uh, the interest from the member opposite. Uh, Speaker, when it comes to adaptation, resiliency, investing in the future, uh, this Premier is taking decisive action, be it in manufacturing of clean steel. We've taken decisive action that's resulted in the equivalent of over 2 million cars off the road. Be it the first ever critical mineral strategy that's working in partnership with Indigenous leaders in the North to ensure that we're going to continue being a leader in electric vehicle manufacturing speaker and attracting over $16 billion in investment into this province. We've also working with uh, stakeholders like the Insurance Bureau on our climate change impact panel. We've worked on the first ever adaptation climate report in this province's history, and we'll continue working with all levels of government to ensure that we build resiliency and adaptation, not just today, but for generations to come. And the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I'm perplexed by this government. They pride themselves in being fiscally responsible and yet continually disregard the facts and figures presented to them. The climate crisis is already costing us. Homes are becoming uninsurable, residents are being faced with colossal damage bills, and people are being displaced unnecessarily. We need to get ahead of this situation and focus on preventative measures. The benefits of climate mitigation are global. The benefits of climate adaptation are local. My all-party climate change committee would focus on the local to ensure Ontarians are ready, they're aware, and they're protected. Why wouldn't you want this for your ridings? Why not work collaboratively across party lines with keen members who have already shown interest all across the chamber? Why not save the people of Ontario hardship, finances, and unnecessary grief by planning ahead with protection in mind? And why not show true leadership and actually lead on emergency preparedness and climate adaptation? Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, let's talk facts. Under that independent member's previous party's rule, they drove jobs out of this province. Yeah. Manufacturing fled Ontario. How does that help adaptation and resiliency when people are forced into poverty because of your reckless policies? Facts are, under this Premier, we've attracted $16 billion in green, clean jobs, positioning us not just today, but for the future. That member wants to be part of action, then join and actually act. Work with your local organizations on Canada-Ontario Agreement, Great Lakes Local Action Order. Fund. Work with local groups on the many funding envelopes open today to take meaningful climate action. The reason she's not speaker is because they're not actually interested in that. They're interested in cheap political points. We're interested in jobs, clean jobs of the future, taking meaningful climate action. We'll continue to do that. Thank you. Order. The next question, a member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, our province labour shortage is impacting the financial and well-being of families across Ontario. Our labour shortage increases the cost of items they purchase every day. It is disrupting businesses and their supply chain and threatens the economic stability. The Canadian Ontario Immigration Agreement nominee program is vital to help fill critical vacancies in our labour market and help support jobs in my riding. Unfortunately, this agreement will expire this fall. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skill Development. What is our government doing to not only renew this program, but help to expand it? Mr. Labour, Immigration, Skills Development, Training. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Lakeshore uh, for this very important question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Ontario proudly welcomes more immigrants than any other province. However, we are only able to select 5% of them less than any other province in Canada. To build a stronger Ontario that works for everyone, we need to double the number of skilled immigrants we can select. That is why, in our ongoing negotiations with the federal government, we've been calling since day one for 18,000 nominations. Mm -hmm. Speaker, we need all hands on deck, and that's why we're working to welcome those with the skills Ontario needs. The Minister for that answer. I'm pleased that our government is advocating for a significant expansion of the number of skilled immigrants selected by Ontario. However, I often hear from my constituents in my riding that it takes months or even years to get applicants processed. Many of these people are eager to start work now and in local businesses in Mississauga Lakeshore and are ready to hire them now. Mr. Speaker, my question again is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skill Development. What is our government doing to help speed up this immigration process? Mr. Labour. Thank you again uh, to the member for this very important question. A speaker, in our conversations with the federal government, we proposed expanding work permit eligibility. Ontario supports the recent change by Ottawa to allow international students to work more than 20 hours a week. However, Speaker, there is a lot more work that needs to be done. On average, our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, is processing immigration applications within 90 days, so within three months, Mr. Speaker. But then it takes Ottawa up to 42 months to do their part. We're never going to resolve uh, labour shortages if it takes four years to get a skilled worker into Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we've offered our processing capacity to the federal government to help speed up the process. We want to work together to resolve these challenges and to help fill uh, the 400,000 jobs that are going unfilled every single day in Ontario. The next question, the member for Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Bon Halloween. Ma question est pour le Premier. My question is to the Premier. Members of Hospice Palliative Care are at Queen's Park today. Their message is really clear. Annualized funding, operating funding increases are needed now to prevent the collapse, the collapse of the lower cost, highly valued hospice sector. Does the Premier think that palliative care patients should do grocery shopping, cook their own food, wash their own dishes? Does he think that they should change their own bed and do their own laundry? Does he think that they should clean their room, wash the floor, take their crash to, trash to the curb? Does he think that palliative care patients should pay for heat, hydro, telephone, cable, internet? Then why is it that the Premier does not fund any of these basic services in Ontario hospices? Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. This government, this Premier, and the Ministry of Health are committed to supporting high-quality palliative and end-of-life care for all Ontarians who need it. And I think we've done more than any government in recent history to support that initiative. In 2019-20, the Ministry provided uh, Hospice Palliative Care Ontario with 1.5 seven million, sorry, in additional funding over two years to support initiatives related to advanced care planning. In October 2021, Ontario introduced a one-time investment of 23 million in hospice residences across the province to help them continue to provide high-quality, compassionate end-of-life services and care to people and their loved ones during the COVID-19 pandemic. The ministry is also supporting new hospices across Ontario by contributing to the cost of operating and constructing Bonds. new and existing facilities. This government is making historic investments in palliative and end-of-life care, and we will continue to do so. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The government funds 50 per cent of the operating cost of our hospices. The community funding model that the hospice depend on is broken. The word hospice palliative care is nowhere in the last budget that this government table. The reality is that the costs continue to escalate while community donation power is challenged by economic realities, including the pandemic. Hospices are not only a, va a valve for emergency room crisis, 
but they are an access point for grief, for bereavement, for mental health services. Members of Hospice Palliative Care are here to remind us, and I quote, Hospice palliative care means system saving and efficiencies. It means improved patient care and caregiver experience. Speaker, nobody should spend their last day alive washing dishes. Can your government commit today to funding hospices to a minimum of 70% of their operating cost? Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite. Again, I would say our government has done a lot to support uh, palliative care and end-of-life care in Ontario. In December 2021, thanks to the great work of the member from Niagara West Lincoln, uh, the ministry introduced the Provincial Framework for Palliative Care following his Compassionate Care Act as a tool to help provide better connected care across the province and guide future work to ensure all Ontarians receive the respect, dignity and care that they deserve at every stage of their life and across the continuum of care. The province has increased dedicated investments in hospice expansion and palliative care quality improvement initiatives from $67 million in 2018 to over $74 million in 2022. This government and Ministry of Health recognizes the important role that hospices play in helping people live well from the time of diagnosis to a terminal illness at the end of life Response. and while grieving a death. We continue to look for other opportunities to work with uh, and implement the province's palliative care framework and to work with Hospice Palliative Care Ontario. Well done. <laughs> Next question, the member for Thunder Bay Atacoka. Thank you, Speaker. With its beautiful, diverse landscape, it's no surprise to see why Northern Ontario is becoming a highly sought-after destination for many film production teams aiming to create high-quality content. Unfortunately, the film industry experienced challenges during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. We as a government must make the necessary investments now to ensure that the film and entertainment industry in Northern Ontario remains competitive. Speaker, can the Minister of Northern Development please share how our government is supporting this vital industry? Thank you. Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Thunder Bay, Ada Koken, since uh, uh, joining our caucus. He's been a tremendous influence sure, yeah. and he has presided over consultations that are bringing home to, to bear, Mr. Speaker, an important sector emerging in Northern Ontario, and that is film and television industry. You know, at the last uh, NOHFC meeting, we announced more than $6 million for film and television production, Mr. Speaker. Some of those resources were going to support production companies that would book no more than 10 major productions moving forward. That's significant, Mr. Speaker. You look at the numbers, we've invested more than half a billion dollars in the New Look Northern Ontario Heritage Fund that has leveraged more than $1.82 billion in investment in creating uh, more than 7,500 jobs. The film and television stream of the NOHFC has been redesigned, Mr. Speaker, to expand the industry across Response. Northern Ontario, create more jobs, and create better filming and television seen the world over. Thank you. A supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, with a skilled labour shortage in the North, we must create jobs in the film and entertainment industry so our local economies can thrive once again. Northern Ontario truly represents a unique part of the world. We have a unique cultural contribution to the filmmaking and enter entertainment sector with individuals representing Indigenous, French and English communities as well as new Canadians. Together, the North contributes to producing unique, high-quality film and entertainment content that the world enjoys. Speaker, once again, can the Minister of Northern Development please outline the investments our government is making for this sector and how they will benefit Northern communities? Thank you. Minister of Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The important point here is that film production companies are moving into Northern Ontario, not for cheap tax credits or a money grab, Mr. Speaker. They're building a platform 
Canador College in Nipissing, North Bay, Mr. Speaker, Sudbury and Sault Ste. Marie are becoming destinations for major television and film production. And the members on to something. We saw firsthand how this ho helps local residents. Young people are, are going to college in Northern Ontario to work on stages, Mr. Speaker, in Northern Ontario. So from construction to production, from stage hands to stars, from the landscape to lights, camera, action, people in the filming sector, Mr. Speaker, are talking about a holiday. Uh, Hollywood North, Mr. Speaker. It's just that it's Hollywood Northern Ontario. The next question, member for University of Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Toronto has a homelessness crisis. The wait list for supportive housing is 21,000 people long, and we only housed 185 people last year. Our shelters are full. The Premier has set a goal of building new homes for Ontarians. But if the Premier is so concerned about building new housing, why is he cutting over $100 million from the province's housing program to build affordable housing? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker, and uh, thanks for this uh, question. I've, I've answered it many, many times. Um, we take the approach in the housing space that every government needs to do their part, whether it be municipalities, and I look forward to uh, hopefully having your support for Bill 23 in a few minutes, um, but also with the federal government. And, and over time, federal, uh, provincial, cost share programs come and they go. Um, we're at a crisis point with the federal government. We obviously want to work collaboratively with them uh, for their $4 billion housing accelerator fund. The Premier's office and the Prime Minister's office have had some great preliminary conversations. But, you know, this member knows the answer to this question. I've asked her many, many times for her party to support our call to the federal government. You know the housing need. You just articulated Response. it in your question. But we're being shortchanged $480 million by the federal government. When are you going to join us and support our call for more dollars? Uh, ask the members to make their comments through the floor. Supplementary question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. I recognize that the Premier is in his chair today, so hopefully we can get an answer from him today. Nevertheless, my Stop the call. Start the clock. Recognize the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you very much. My question for the Premier is, chronic homelessness and encampments are growing across Ontario in every big city, including Toronto and including into my riding in Toronto Centre. Temporary ho ho COVID hotels are getting ready to close. This includes the Novotel and the Bond Hotel, which will take 610 shelter beds out of the system when the system is already oversubscribed. Bill 23 does nothing to end to house a single homeless person in encampment. Bill 23 does nothing to end homelessness, mental health, or the opiate crisis that 29 big mayors have spoken to. Speaker, why is the Premier cutting $100 million from Ontario's housing program when we need more investments and not less for deeply affordable housing in Ontario right now? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. You know, again, Speaker, we'd be a, a lot closer to having those extra federal dollars if we got some cooperation uh, from the NDP. They consistently talk a good game in the legislature, but then when we ask for them to put Order. partnership over partisanship, this is the kind of rhetoric uh, we, we get from this, this group. We put our money where our mouth was in our term of our new homelessness prevention program. We consolidated three supportive housing programs and added an additional $25 million to our municipal partners. We, When we started uh, the Social Services Relief Fund at the very start of the pandemic, who would have thought that we would have supported our municipal colleagues to the tune of $1.2 billion? In addition, Speaker, uh, our homelessness prevention, our suite of homelessness programs now equal almost half a Response. billion dollars, but we still are short $480 million from the federal government, and I think Ontarians would love to have support from that party on the opposite yeah. side. The next question, the member for Brampton West. Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Uh, Speaker, I hear concerns from my constituents about the housing market. Parents ask me how their children will be able to afford family homes in their communities. Young individuals are worried about their future in this province and if they will still have an opportunity for home ownership. 
Speaker, I want men's words. Many people are worried about the housing situation they currently face in Ontario. That is why our government tabled our most recent housing plan last week. An essential part of this plan is increasing the non-resident speculation tax rate. Speaker, can the Minister of Finance please explain why it was essential to increase the rate to 25% when it was just increased to 20% in March of this year? Minister of Finance. Thank you to the member from Brampton West for that question and all the members from Brampton that uh, are surrounding me here. We know the people of Ontario are facing the rising cost of uh, living in shortage of homes, and our government has a strong mandate to help the people of Ontario find a home that is right for them. Ontario needs more housing, and we need it now. We are building a durable foundation for action that will increase housing supply and attainability over the long term. Mr. Speaker, that is why. We announced an increase to the non-resident speculation tax to 25 per cent to prioritize Ontario families and home buyers. Mr. Speaker, this increase means Ontario has the most comprehensive NRST in the land. And finally, Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. As part of this commitment to tackle Ontario's housing crisis, we Spons. are prioritizing Ontario families and home buyers, not speculators. And a supplementary question. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for that answer. Speaker, the federal government recently introduced in their 2022 budget a ban on foreign investors buying Canadian residential property. The federal government plan would completely restrict foreign buyers from purchasing a property anywhere in our country, effective January 2023. With our government increasing non-residential speculation tax rate at the same time as the federal government introduces their restriction on foreign buyers, it appears that this is creating an overlap in regulations. Speaker, could the Minister of Finance please tell us how our plan differs from what the federal government is proposing and how will this help my constituents enter the housing market? Good question. Minister of Finance. And to the member for that question, the, the foreign buyer ban the federal government is proposing would be temporary, and some proposed ex exceptions appear to be to still permit residential property purchases in Ontario. That may be subject to the NRST. But, Mr. Speaker, while we support the federal government's actions following Ontario's lead in addressing housing supply, this government knows the housing crisis is not temporary. It is a long-term challenge that requires long-term solutions. Mr. Speaker, that is why we increased the NRST to 25 per cent and eliminated loopholes by focusing relief eligibility to newcomers Excellent. who commit to laying down roots in Ontario long term so that Ontario has the most comprehensive non-resident speculation tax in the land. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, Spots. all levels of government need to work together to cooperate and address the housing crisis. Here, here. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. In September, alongside my colleague from Toronto St. Paul's, I wrote to you about reports that Niagara hospitals turned away sexual assault survivors from receiving a local sexual assault evidence kit due to staff shortages. Over the last three years, nearly 30 Niagara survivors had been asked to travel as far as Burlington or to come back later. Survivors need to be put first, not have their justice put at risk. Niagara Health is seeking additional funding to support their staffing shortages for their sexual assault hospital program. They've heard nothing from this government. Today, will you approve that funding request, and will it explain why survivors in Niagara are being left behind? Mr. Uh, Speaker, uh, I appreciate the, the question from the honourable member. She'll, of course, know that, and I think uh, across uh, uh, on both sides of the house. Uh, uh, we have uh, constantly taken this uh, issue very, very seriously. That is why, of course, we are putting significant amount of resources into health and human resources uh, uh, into uh, into our hospitals. I know it's a cross-government, uh, uh, frankly, approach, uh, Speaker. It's not just about uh, 
uh, this instance, but we want to make sure that across the province of Ontario, in every region of the province, that the issues raised in the, in the members' questions are being addressed. And that's why we're looking also outside. Uh, uh, the, the Minister of uh, Colleges and University has a bill before this House that I think that moves the, moves the, the bar uh, further, Speaker. But having said that, uh, the member raises a very important point, which we are dealing with, which we are addressing, and we're ensuring that across, not only in her region, but across the province of Ontario, we can help to ensure that all people have access to the, uh, the important uh, uh, services that the member raises. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, whatever it is that you're doing is not good enough. New Brunswick as well reported that survivors had been turned away. However, last week they announced sweeping changes. Simply, this is about priorities. It's about women. It's about justice. Niagara Health, our nurses and frontline staff are going above and beyond doing the best they can. However, they need more support. They need more funding. Can the minister assure women that Ontario's hospital response programs are not understaffed across this province and it will find ways to make sure this situation never, ever happens again? Uh, again, I, I appreciate the member raising uh, the question. It, it is, of course, what we have been focused on. Uh, we knew that as we came out of the pandemic, there would be challenges across many different areas uh, of the government's responsibility. The same types of, uh, of challenges that our, our partners, frankly, in jurisdictions around the world are facing. But that is why we have brought a comprehensive health and human resources uh, 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 policy in front of the House. I know the Minister of uh, Colleges and Universities has been working very closely with the Minister of Health, and we're seeing record numbers of people who want to get into nursing uh, through our colleges and universities. We are seeking, we're seeing records of new people Order. hired uh, into, uh, into the nursing programs. We're hiring hundreds uh, of PSWs. We're expanding health care across the province of Ontario. In, in Niagara, we are adding a, a, a new hospital. Uh, it's also the transition to Ontario health care to have a seamless uh, uh, continuity of care, Mr. Speaker. The member is right, but that is why we're Spons? putting all of these historic resources into rebuilding a health care system that for so long was ignored by the previous government will get the job done for all Ontarians. The next question, the member from Perth Wellington. Speaker, as our lives become increasingly reliant on technology, the threat of cybercrime becomes a more significant concern that we all understand that needs to be better addressed. Cybercrime is no longer just suspicious emails from people claiming to be your long-lost royal relatives from faraway countries. Cybercrime violates individuals' privacy as well as their security of data. Our government must support Ontarians in identifying and avoiding digital threats. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please share with us what our government's plan is to increase awareness around cybercrime? Thank you. Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member, my friend from Perth Wellington, for his question. And if you believe you're a victim of cybercrime, please reach out to the OPP toll free at 1 888 310 1122 to report this, uh, this matter. Cybercrime is a serious issue and should not be overlooked. And that's why our government is investing more than $1.6 million to help fight cybercrime. This funding will support local organizations and their police services to work together to increase awareness about these horrible crimes and prevent them from happening in their communities. Monsieur le Président, new Speaker, new we continue to do difficult work. We continue to achieve everything we can to guarantee safety and security of Ontarians. Thank you, Speaker. The people of my riding in Perth, Wellington, are concerned about cybercrime's impact on them. Seniors are worried about being victims of fraud schemes. Parents are worried about criminals contacting their children over social media. Small businesses are worried about being targeted and shut down by ransom IT attacks. As, and then we are all concerned about the rising threat of online hate crimes. Speaker, can the Solicitor General inform this House how our government's $1.6 million investment will translate into local support, improve cybersecurity, and protect my constituents? Solicitor General. Well, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And once again, I'm grateful for the question from the member from Perth Wellington. And we continue to take action. 
to prevent cybercrime. We're especially focused on crimes such as internet fraud schemes, the luring of young people via social media that can lead to human trafficking, online scams and hate crimes. This $1.6 million investment is being allocated to 18 community-based organizations. And Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased that the, member, uh, that the member from Perth Wellington will be happy to hear that we've allocated $100,000 to Crime Stoppers in Guelph, Wellington, and this organization will work with the OPP and Victim Services Wellington to increase awareness about cyber, cyber safety. Monsieur le Président, rien pour Speaker, as Solicitor General, nothing is more important, more important than safety and security in this province. The next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Auto accidents were down by 40 per cent last year compared to 2019, yet premiums keep going up and insurance company profits hit 27.6 per cent. The cost of living in Ontario is unbearable and drivers continue to be gouged. Auto insurance companies are regulated by this government, so will they do the right thing and return these excess profits back into the pockets of drivers? The Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, for the question opposite, and uh, I'm sure he's noting my tie and saying it's very scary, and of course it's for uh, Halloween, not for your party. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the member asks an important question about auto insurance rates, and of course he'll remember that through the pandemic it was this government working alongside industry and others that had no changes to premiums in 2020 and very limited changes in 2021 producing over a billion dollars of savings for auto drivers in this province, Mr. Speaker. And I'm sure the member opposite will remember it was this Premier and this government that took the license plate stickers off the drivers of 8 million people in this province, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, of course, this member will remember those tolls that the previous government put on the 412, 418. They're off, Response. they're gone, they're gone. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure this member has read the budget where we have a plan for auto insurance. Please take the time to read it. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. This government had an opportunity during the pandemic to give a break to drivers, but instead the only breaks they gave out to, were to auto insurance companies that keep making record profits. <laughs> Speaker, drivers in GTA communities like mine continue to be ripped off simply because of where they live compared to other drivers with similar records in different parts of the city. I tabled a bill to end this unfair treatment. Will the government pass it into law immediately? Ask reply. Mr. Speaker, again, through you to the member opposite. Mr. Speaker, of course, as I referenced in the budget, we have a plan to deal with auto insurance. Mr. Speaker, it's very clear in there. We've got a plan to deal with fairness. We have a plan to deal with choice. We have a plan to attack fraud and abuse in the system. In fact, we've engaged the Financial Services uh, uh, Regulatory Authority, FISRA, of Ontario to collect, start collecting the data so we can go after the bad actors, because it's this government that will have the backs of the drivers and all the good, hard-working people that have to go to and from school and to work every single day and make sure we have their backs. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Scarborough Southwest has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development concerning essential workers. This matter will be debated Tuesday following private members' public business. Also, pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for St. Catharines has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the government house leader concerning sexual assault survivors' kits. This matter will be debated Tuesday following private members' public business. I understand the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs has a point of order. I do. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. If everyone in the House tomorrow morning would like to get an excellent start to your day, I would like to invite everyone to the breakfast that is being hosted tomorrow morning by the Ontario Egg Farmers. It's probably one of the best breakfasts of the year, so I hope to see you in the Legislative Dining Room at 7.30. Thank you very much.